Okay, so I'm going to be handing over to um, Beth, who is going to be facilitating today's session. She's um, an experienced community organiser and um, also now runs training in community organising for uh, the Centre for Progressive Change. So she's going to be facilitating today's session, giving you a 101 on the basics of community organising. And we've also got three really inspiring speakers, organisers that are going to tell you their stories and about their work. So I will hand over to you, Beth. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. It's really nice to see all your faces on this Saturday morning. Um, I was just saying to everyone else, Saturday 10am feels very different to weekday 10am, even though we're in lockdown and every day is the same. So well done for getting up. I hope you all have a coffee uh, and are ready to do some community organising. Um, so we thought we'd start today's session with hearing from some amazing community organisers who can give us a kind of understanding of the work they do, uh, the work they do in different types of contexts um, and kind of give you a grounding in what it is like to be a community organiser and, and what we can achieve by doing community organising, what it means to build power in communities and how we win through community organising. So we're going to hear from those speakers and we're going to have a chance to have some questions. And then for the second half of the session, we're going to have a very uh, speedy 101 session um, on some of the key skills and principles around community organising. So thinking about um, both community mapping and power mapping and talking through how you can use those in the work that you do locally. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunity to ask questions and to participate um, and to get different perspectives on how community organising is a really powerful tool to win. Uh, so yeah, I hope you really, really enjoyed the session. So we're going to hear from the speakers first, and it'd be great if everyone could put loads of questions in the chat. So we're going to try and fit in quite a lot into this session. So we're going to have speakers and then questions. And what I'm going to do is take some questions from the chat throughout the session to ask them quickly uh, at the end of, of their speeches um, so we can move quickly into the session. So please do ask questions uh, of the speakers in the chat so I can make sure we get as many in as possible. Um, before we move into the practical side. Um, so we're going to start off with Paul, who is a organiser from Citizens UK. Um, so yeah, going to hand over to Paul, go for it. Wow, good morning, everybody. Um, absolutely fantastic to be with you all. Um, it's, it's so lovely to see people that are um, interested at, and taking organising seriously, especially in this time. Um, it's, of course, we're still in a pandemic, hopefully bouncing back uh, on a trajectory upwards. But even in this pandemic, it's been a, a, an opportunity, really, for people to think about how do we organise uh, and how do we get back better? Um, I, I, and uh, just a way of introducing myself, um, yeah, I, I work for Citizens UK. I've been an organiser for nine years. In August, it will be 10 years that I've been organising professionally. And um, prior to that, I, I was involved with Citizens UK um, as, a, as a young leader. A and my introduction to organising and politics of a small p um, was when I was 14. Uh, and so I think I start there um, because when I was 14, I was a young black boy that went to a, a school in Forest Gate um, with my rucksack very much tightly uh, 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 wound on my back. Um, with ambitions to be a lawyer, um, ambitions to escape the depths of East London, really. Um, and so I was quite blinkered to what was going on around me um, until it hit me in the face, uh, which, it, which it does uh, uh, quite regularly. Um, and when I was 14, um, two of my friends were stabbed in Forest Gate in the spate of stabbings in 2006, 2007. I think many of you will remember the faces that kept on popping up on the evening standard a new young person and one of those young people was one of my friends and it was one of those typical situations when everyone was devastated angry not knowing what to do what next really um, and our local church this roman catholic school saint bonaventures you know the response was we're going to do a vigil and we're going to light candles and that wasn't good enough for me as a 14 year old boy. What was candles gonna do for Aaron? 
Um, what was Candles going to do for us? What was Candles going to do for my brothers that were going to have to travel the same streets, get on the same buses? Um, and I remember going to my director of sixth form uh, and him saying that the school was part of an alliance. The school was a part of an alliance that was also caring about um, safety and, and youth justice. And that actually, they wanted to do something about it. They wanted to take some action. And I didn't know we had this network and we had these relationships. And uh, like schools do, he asked me to go as a representative to this meeting that was happening at the church. And I, I went and I remember being the only young person there. I think there's probably a 40 year gap from me to the next person. Um, and I sat there with about three elderly ladies, um, my local priest and what I, I later learned was a community organizer. And we shared stories really. Um, and me being a young black boy, uh, uh, with the elderly, mostly white women, telling stories about the same thing, about being afraid, being fearful of going out after six, uh, me telling stories about being fearful on my journey to school, them telling stories about being fearful of um, going out for their shopping after 6 p.m. And we connected despite our differences um, around um, wanting to feel safe. And I remember telling all sorts of stories that day because it was the first time that I really felt invited to share stories in my community uh, and then I was I was ready to go I was ready to leave that meeting stand up and go back to school and carry on with the journey to law um, and my priest kind of at the end of the meeting said okay what are we going to do next um, uh, uh, and uh, how are we going to build power and I'd never heard any of these things before <laughs> Uh, and I didn't know what I could do. I was 14. What could I do? Uh, and it was suggested that they, I was needed. Uh, and I remember one of the ladies saying, we need you. We need you to connect us and bring more young people. And as a 14 year old, I'd never felt needed. I'd never felt needed. And I was needed because I had story and I was needed because they saw that I had power now. Uh, and I remember going away um, and uh, uh, um, going back to school, not being so angry, instead having some direction to go speak to my other friends about what can we do? You know, this thing has happened to us. What can we do? And actually I had this next meeting that everybody could come to. So all my conversations always ended well, well, come, come to the next meeting. Um, and I remember getting three young people to the next meeting and uh, 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 everybody celebrating and giving round of applause and saying, thank you, we're, we're, get, we're getting stronger, we're getting closer to a place where we can take action. And we eventually did. We eventually had about 70 people meeting regularly um, in, in Forest Gates from schools, mosques, churches, all from the neighborhood, all caring about safety, all rocked by the, the stabbings that happened locally. And we marched down to uh, uh, East Ham Town Hall, which is in Newham, and East London and, and took on the tyrant, which was Sir Robin Wells, the mayor there who'd been in power for 28 years. And we agitated him that he needed to make the, the, the street safer. And that we, even though he wouldn't recognize that there was a gang problem, we knew there was, and we were feeling it. And we put him on the spot and he, 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 he bent. He gave us 150,000 pounds to create stewards on the street um, during school time. And for me, that was a massive win. It was huge. It was huge because it was the first time I'd interacted with people that was different to me. It was huge because I suddenly had a network of people that I knew I could take action with. And um, I'd, I'd come across this method, uh, this method of organizing that actually could, could make changes for not only the world, but more importantly for me. And, um, and organizing, we take seriously self-interest and how we can be effective um, uh, when we when we act on our the issues we care about. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. I know I've got limited time left. Um, I, I just wanted to show you if I can. Oh, skipping past all of this. Oh, well, let me skip past it. Aha. So um, organizing for us with Citizens UK, um, we, we, we focus really on institution. And, and we focus on institution because for us, it's more effective to work with little pockets of power. Um, 
pockets of organized people and organized money. Uh, and by bringing those institutions into relationship, we have more chance of bringing about change. And, and really we focus on the areas of obviously creating positive change, structural change. Um, and, and many of you might have heard of the living wage or the, the real living wage. And that came about through organizing 25 years ago in East London, where we were organizing the dock workers that were horrified by the fact they were building these high rises in Canary Wharf, where all the bankers were gonna come and make lots of money in their area, but yet they weren't being paid properly. And so we organized with them and East London Mosque and Queen Mary to make the first case for a living wage. And now we see the living wage changing policy right at the top, um, giving the country a pay rise. And we've seen about 1.5, uh, 1.8 billion pounds transferred from the, the, the private sector to the, um, civil society. Um, and so that's real structural change. That's what we're aiming for. Um, but the way we do that is really through strengthening organizations. How do we get institutions to be stronger, to stop falling apart, to stop losing its people, but be stronger, be more effective. Um, and so we work with um, civil society institutions, churches, mosques, synagogues, schools, universities, trade unions, charities, what, you, what have you, um, that are interested in creating change and last but not least, developing leaders. And so um, developing leaders is the common theme. You know, you can create change. You can think about what next, but there's always gonna be a what next. There's always gonna be a new issue. And so what is the true magic about organizing is it's a way of bringing people out of their frustration into a place where they have relationship, into a place where they have a craft that they are uh, confident can create change. Um, and so we're developing leaders constantly to be a place where um, they are now in relationship, they're now in alliances that can allow them to take on any issue. Um, so very lastly, um, just a little bit about Citizens UK. We have 18 chapters across um, the country, um, about 500 member in, uh, institutions, 150 of them being schools, um, about 250 of them being faith um, institutions. Uh, and we think really about how do we raise our own hard money um, so that we are in charge of uh, 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 what we do. We can take on um, whoever we need to take on. Um, and so uh, uh, for us, it's about really building that power so that we are able to, to act together. Um, I'm gonna pass on because I can't see the chat running and I'm sure I'm over time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. That was perfect timing. Um, thank you for sharing your story. It was really powerful. And also for kind of talking about those institutions that we need to bring together. Um, in the latter part of this session, we're going to get you to do some mapping of the institutions in your communities that you can bring together. So that was a really helpful introduction. Um, we're going to move to my Muna, uh, who is a community organiser for Migrants Organised. Um, so I will give her the floor. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so nice to see so many of you on a Saturday morning, and I am feeling very um, envious that your introduction to community organising is um, by Beth, uh, because we had the pleasure of organising together, and she is brilliant. So, um, yeah, you've got a great session ahead of you. Um, my name is Maimuna. I work for an organisation called Migrants Organise. Uh, we work with migrants and refugees to build power and take action uh, for migrant justice. So um, I want to start by saying that community organising, as you all know, is not a new concept um, at all. Uh, it's simply the process of building grassroots power um, and it involves communities defining their own problems, designing and leading their own campaigns and people gathering together around a shared set of values and progressive principles uh, for pushing for longer term structural change. It's really hard and it's often a long process, um, but there are many um, examples of migrant organizing in the UK um, that I just wanted to briefly touch on. Um, for example, the migrant workers at Grunwick who 
organize for better living, better working conditions, um, better pay. Um, and one of the tools that they used was organizing these big community actions. So they got the whole community involved in um, their workplace dispute. Um, so, and elsewhere in, in London, in West London, um, the organization I currently work for, Migrants Organized, was formed by 14 different migrant leaders coming together um, and building this coalition um, in the early 90s to organize for, for migrant rights as well. Um, and that is really at the heart of um, what, we, what we try to do at Migrants Organized. Um, so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to sharing some slides because I know that you will be um, looking at listening campaigns later on in the session. Um, so I thought I could highlight um, how we use some of those community organizing tools, such as um, listening campaigns, relational meetings, to build um, what we're now calling the Fair Immigration Reform Movement Charter. Um, and I'll also try and highlight some examples of um, organizing during the pandemic, um, if I have time. So just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay. Are you all able to see that? Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. Okay, so the Fair Immigration Reform Movement Charter, um, the process of it took many years. So I think it was across um, three years and it was a process of us um, listening to what the main issues were, um, in various different uh, regions across the UK with leaders that we'd been working with, um, a, a lot of them on like issue campaigns. So for example, um, there were people in London who were taking action to secure community space. Um, um, a lot of them were second generation migrants um, and felt like they weren't represented in the area. We brought them into the, to the conversation with other people who um, we're living in um, contingency asylum accommodation um, in very poor conditions there and we're taking action um, to hold um, companies like G4S to account. So anyway, there were all of these various different issues um, and uh, what we did was bring people together um, to kind of outline how it is that we can actually um, really build a migrant led movement um, and, and actually have um, a shared set of demands which, you know, despite people working on, on, uh, on their own campaigns and securing wins, that they all felt part of something um, bigger. So this, um, the pictures here show some of that process. Um, yeah, so lots of one-to-one um, -one meetings, lots of, um, listening meetings with various different groups um, and I'm sure Beth will talk you through the process of organizing um, organizing listening meetings and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the demands for the Fair Immigration Reform Movement Charter which um, people came up with were simply dignity, ending the hostile environment, justice, um, re-entering justice in our society, welcome um, and action. Um, so do, taking action together. Um, and taking action together to push for real structural change. Um, so how does how is a firm charter now being used in a practical sense? Um, in October, during the during the pandemic, um, various groups came together um, and took action under the banner Solidarity Knows No Borders. And so this was again people working on, on various different things from reporting to um, anti-deportations, all, um, all in agreement of the principles of, of the Charter and fighting for migrant justice, um, took place in it, um, actions all across uh, the UK. So we had over a thousand people, which um, I think is a really, really awesome example of how, um, despite the challenges that are facing us um, with the pandemic and, despite um, the people taking action being amongst some of the most marginalized in society and really, um, really suffering under, under the coronavirus pandemic, still being able to take action and still being able to um, 
win actually so i'll talk about some of the the impact of of the actions afterwards um but the weekend of actions actually was um it was built through a distributed model of organizing um where staff and volunteers um undertook a lot of one-to-one -one relational meetings to build support for this weekend of action um and people had various different roles um they shared resources um kind of built coalitions of support in different regions around actions and in some instances it was the first time that people had worked together in this way so um, in Merseyside um, over 14 different groups um, came together and are now still organizing together under uh, Merseyside Solidarity Knows no, no Borders group um, so it yeah it was um, it was a it was a great weekend uh, there were direct actions with demands to close down Napier barracks, um, various actions outside reporting centres, um, um, graffiti murals with demands, various different creative ways um, of taking action, and you can see in some of the pictures here. Um, so since then, what was the impact of um, you know, this long process of building a charter and then people taking action um, under the banner of the charter and solidarity knows no borders. Um, the, the real, the, 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 the impact that I think is, um, is most remarkable actually is that there are now groups of people who are working in a coordinated way, all striving uh, for the same thing. Um, so we have now regular organizing meetings, um, with various people and it's it's I mean probably before the pandemic it would have been harder to do this actually but these are people from all different um, places in the UK like here you'll see this is Abigail Gaveni um, like remote rural part um, of the UK um, joining meetings with people in London um, and they're still continuing to to do that and to organize um, in a coordinated way as a result of um, some of this organizing during the pandemic, the Abolish Reporting campaign was launched this week. Um, and that is led by people who have um, direct experience of having to go into reporting centers um, and report to the Home Office even during the pandemic and are having to travel miles and miles and miles, um, you know, putting themselves at risk in order to do so. Um, and we, we did have a, we had a win during the pandemic, which was um, that the Home Office suspended reporting um, throughout the lockdown. And we're trying now to build on that. So that's the launch of this campaign, which is uh, demanding that uh, reporting is being, uh, should be abolished full stop. Um, it, yeah, it's been led by people who are having to report and it's now uh, off the back of this weekend of action, there's a real, real base of support uh, for this campaign uh, with over 200 people attending the launch from various different regions, um, again, in the UK. Um, another example, again, is people coming together um, around the issues of contingency asylum accommodation. And you would have seen the headlines around Napier barracks and some of the conditions there. Um, and people coming together around that to submit evidence um, to the Chief Inspector of um, Borders and Immigration and organizing now um, to, to make sure that people are not living in those conditions. Um, we, they recently, um, some of the hotels that people are living in and, and barracks that people are living in have found out that there, there is gonna be some, some movement on that. So yeah, that, that's, um, I think that's all I have time for, so I won't go on for, for much longer, but yeah, happy to take questions um, and please do um, support the charter. I'll share a link in, in the chat as well. Thank you, Maimuna. Um, she spoke about me at the beginning, so I'm going to speak about her. Maimuna is one of the most talented organisers and people I've ever met, and that is not an exaggeration. Um, and the work that Migrants Organised do is really important and amazing. So please do um, click the link in the chat and find out more and support the Charter, which is really important. Uh, great, so we're going to move on to Lauren. Um, and this is great because we've got speakers from different perspectives of organising um, or, or organising in different contexts. And Lauren is an, is an ACORN organiser, um, so it's going to talk uh, about ACORN. Handing over to you. 
Thanks, Beth. And yeah, it's really exciting to be on this panel with like such amazing organisers and like hearing about all your experiences in the community. I'm like, yeah, very excited to hear more about it later on. Um, so yeah, any, for anyone who doesn't know, ACORN is a community and tenants union with thousands of members in dozens of towns and cities up and down the UK. Uh, we use direct action to fight on issues impacting working class people from housing to public transport, road safety and much more. Um, so I joined ACORN as a member two years ago um, after attending an introduction to community organising session. Um, at the time, I had no experience of politics or activism. Um, I actually found those spaces quite intimidating. Like I'd left school when I was 16. Um, I've been a waitress for like 10 years. And I didn't think that I had the sort of vocabulary or knowledge to engage in these sort of like issues, um, despite the fact that they impacted me on a personal level every single day of my life. Um, and the first time somebody explained community organizing to me, it was just like the penny just dropped. It was so simple. It didn't need like heavy theory to understand it. Just a desire to make things better and a willingness to take action. And it was about ordinary people using strength in numbers to level the playing field and make demands of people in power and to win as well. Um, it was a hugely transformative thing to learn about. And yeah, it was something I could engage with as a person who had lived experience of these issues of poor housing and low wage work and bad public transport. And this is like a really typical journey for one of our members. Um, very often joining ACORN is their first experience of organizing and many of them don't think of themselves as activists. We're a union of ordinary people fighting for extraordinary change. Um, so skipping forward two years, um, I'm now the member defense coordinator for ACORN in Sheffield. And in the past few years, the union's just gone from strength to strength. Like in 2020 alone, we grew from 2000 to over 5,000 members. Um, we've now got active groups and branches in over 20 cities and towns across the UK, from Brighton to Bradford, Norwich, Swindon, Cardiff, Enfield, many more. We're growing every day. Um, we've also seen huge wins at every level from stopping our members getting evicted from their homes to getting national banks to change discriminatory policies. And I'll go over some of these wins in a bit more detail now, um, just to demonstrate how effective this model has been. So in 2017, Bristol City Council announced plans to scrap the council tax reduction benefit, which would force the 25,000 poorest households in Bristol to start paying council tax. ACORN members knocked on doors, collected petition signatures, organised accountability meetings with local councillors. Um, as a result of that, the plans were dropped, and to date, that's put over £24 million back into the pockets of the city's poorest residents. In 2018, members across the country occupied branches of NatWest and Lloyd's TSB banks, protesting their no DSS clause, which prevented people who had mortgages with those banks renting to people on benefits. Um, the clause was scrapped after our action was taken, um, which was one of our biggest national wins. Um, in 2017 and 2019, members in Newcastle won major victories around fire safety in tower blocks, uh, forcing building owners to take down unsafe cladding, install thermal CCTV and sprinklers to keep their residents safe. And in 2020, members in Sheffield's Park Hill block organised against an energy bill hike that was imposed by the property developer Urban Splash right in the middle of the pandemic when a load of residents had just lost their jobs or lost their income. Um, after a campaign that involved noise protests on balconies, collecting dozens of pledge cards and video clips from residents and confronting the CEO during an Instagram photo shoot, uh, Acorn won a reversal of the price hike and refunds for all 250 households in the block. Um, we're also winning victories for individual members every day as part of our member defence work, uh, stopping evictions, reclaiming stolen deposits, forcing landlords to carry out necessary repairs and much, much more amounting to thousands and thousands of pounds won back for our members. And we do this through community organising. So our members are the lifeblood of our organisation. They plan and turn out to actions, they organise campaigns, they speak to the press, they do research, they lead on member defence cases, they make amazing social media content, they do outreach in their own communities, they sit on our committees and on our national board and much, much more. Our affordable dues means that we're funded and driven by our members and that we're able to sustain the long term growth of the organisation. And we also have staff members like myself in towns and cities up and down the country and every day we are out in the community knocking on doors recruiting more members to the union and supporting and developing our membership to take on bigger fights and win bigger victories and being part of acorn both as a member and now as a staffer has been the most empowering inspiring and exciting experience of my entire life 
uh, working class people in this country, uh, we're so often told to sit down and shut up and be grateful for what we're given. Um, and organizations like ACORN provide a means for us to come together and demand better for ourselves and our communities. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. That got loads of arm shaking. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing. It's so exciting and energizing to hear about wins. Um, and that is a big part of community organizing. Any community organizer will tell you is that we're focused on uh, winning and doing things that win. Um, and as I'm sure lots of you have experience of, when you win, there's nothing like that feeling. Um, so thank you so much for sharing um, stories of what amazing work that ACON's doing in your own journey um, into ACON. So we're going to take some questions. We have, we're, we're um, yeah, we're going to squeeze in as many as possible in the next kind of like 10 minutes. So please do put any questions you have in the chat. And um, we've got one that I will start off with, which um, is for Paul specifically um, from Richard, who wants to hear a little bit more about the climate change work and how Citizens UK have found a way to inspire climate action. Um, Richard says we've done loads of online connecting to and found there was energy online the meetings. I think that's in reference to doing listening online, but just maybe you could chat a bit about the listening campaign you did um, around climate action. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, but first, thank you, uh, Maimuna and, and Lauren. Absolutely amazing wins. Uh, and uh, it's, so, it's so good to hear about all the other work that's going on. It's only going to happen if we all are organizing around our interests and, and it's perfect example there of the of the of the different spaces. Um, um, in regards to climate change, uh, it's, it's a campaign really that uh, again it naturally it, it, it is grassroots. I know it's something that everybody always says, but you know the way that this came out was really through some listening that started happening in West London citizens, um, which is which is a, a, a very a, the smallest branch of our chapters really in, in London citizens. Uh, and they, they really wanted to push the idea of how we've never really worked on an environmental issue as Citizens UK. So did, did what we would say they should do, which is organize, build some power, build some relationships around it. And they were able to get about 20 member institutions to vote to add climate change to their own West London agenda, which again then started to inspire people across London citizens and then nationally. Um, I guess what was really important was tasking those people to say, actually, how, how do they raise money around this to, 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 to build some capacity so that they can do the kind of depth of listening um, that was needed to, to, to sway not only our organisation, but then the, 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 the decision makers that they were going to go to. Uh, but then also there was some work to actually look at what was going on. And we found out that there was some work that had been connecting really to jobs and opportunities that we felt was a great way to to bring these two self-interests together um and uh, uh, we then looked again at how we could build relationships with those that were interested in poverty and tie the issue to that as well so that team got very strategic about how does climate change be more than just the environment and more about justice more about justice for um the poor uh, uh, justice for those that are, 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 um, um, are discriminated. And, and so the two ways that we've linked it up really is about um, kind of uh, uh, kind of a fuel poverty. And so we started to see a way of drumming up energy for this by getting churches, mosques, synagogues, schools, what have you, big institutions to start doing collective switch. Um, and so doing listening, find out how much people are paying, um, uh, find, out, uh, find out how much the last time they changed, find out how it's impacting them, and then collectively changing to a green um, uh, energy provider on the same day. And it's been huge action, really, exciting action, you know, coming in, your whole church, 600 of you are changing to, uh, uh, you know, it's feeling of power, and that inspired people to think more about what does green energy look like. And then lastly, just um, in regards to creating green jobs. So we are now taking this, this group that has started to buzz um, towards the mayoral elections to then put pressure on Sadiq Khan to create 100,000 um, uh, green jobs. 
uh, and uh, we hope that again that will tie to a lot of the conversation about lack of opportunities um so yeah great amazing work um yeah lots of different ways you can connect things like uh, these green issues to other issues that are really important to people and um, we've got some more questions coming in we've got two questions from two different clairs about listening campaigns um one of the questions is about how we can do listening in the current pandemic context so how can we listen not in in physical meetings and then we have another question from another Claire that says I'd like to hear how do you listen in a way that includes the most marginalized who are often so busy just living their lives um I don't know if maybe we can kick off with my Muna and then if anyone else wants to, to jump in on that question then go for it yeah sure um I'll go to the one of how do you do listening um, that includes the most marginalised who are often busy, busy living their lives first, because it's a really, really good question. Um, I think there can be, I mean, often we think of listening being like a listening meeting, like a house meeting or something like that. But I mean, when we, um, when we were organising around some of the um, um, housing conditions in North London, what we did was just knock on people's doors, actually. Um, and so we went round with a, with a, with a survey um, and yeah, that, that's how we did it. Basically, we went from door to door, um, finding out what the conditions were, and that was led by residents. So you know, they could go back and follow up with people, and then they had like you know, coffee mornings, um, like bringing together like three or four people um, to discuss further. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's one way. Uh, so working around um, working around people's schedules in that way. Um, and then other ways, I guess, during the pandemic, actually, we have found that um, we've had attendance from people um, at various meetings who wouldn't normally come to some of our meetings in person, because actually, it's easier for people with caring responsibilities, or maybe who work um, like really long hours or whatever to just log in on, on, on their phone. And so, yeah, some of the meetings are like, even with people who are, um, delivery workers who are like literally like logging in on zoom as they're cycling do you know what I mean like you can um it has made it um accessible so um yeah that's I'll hand over to my colleagues to check in. great thanks Marina yeah we've we've found I think across the board that while some people don't have access to the internet and that is a separate um you know that can be can be a big issue that we're trying to work around um in other ways being able to use Zoom has opened up organising to lots more people. Did either Paul or Lauren want to jump in on this question? Go for it, Lauren. Yeah, I'm happy to speak a bit on this. And like, yeah, it's a really fantastic question. Um, one that we're asking ourselves all the time is like, how do you engage with people who have caring responsibilities, who work multiple jobs, who don't necessarily have a lot of free time to commit to an organisation? Um, and it's something that I hear a lot from people when I talk to them on the doors when they say, oh, it sounds really great. I'd love to get involved, but I just don't have enough time. And almost inevitably, those are the, exactly the same people who are the most affected by the issues that we're campaigning on. And so you want to engage them in your campaigns. And like, I'd love to say that there is a really clear answer to this issue. But like, I think it's something that we're having to work on and develop all the time. And like, yeah, like as Beth said, like Zoom has been like really transformative for some people, particularly people who have like disabilities, who've been able to engage when they couldn't come to physical meetings in the past. But it has also excluded a lot of people who don't have internet access who, or who aren't sort of tech savvy. Um, and I think like hopefully as we move a little bit further out of the pandemic, we'll be able to sort of use a kind of combined approach of having different types of meetings so different people can get involved. Offering things like childcare um, at physical meetings as well, I think is something that's really important. Um, and I think like in terms of like the day to day work of the organisation, because of our members are the ones who are doing the work. Um, one thing that we found like really positive is having this like huge variety of like ways for people to engage like some people don't necessarily for whatever reason feel comfortable coming along to an in-person action or physically can't come along to an in-person action but you know they might be able to do like phone banking from home um, or they might be able to do a bit of research um, on a target um, they might be able to organize in their own communities like they might already have um, ties in community organizations or community demographics who they might be able to link us up with and it's about constantly having this dialogue um, with people in your organization with people in the community and saying what do you want to do but like, how do you feel like you could get involved like what can we do to make sure there are ways for you to get involved 
And I think like trying to solve that problem, like as organizers is really challenging, but like as with every aspect of community organizing, the best way to get around it is just to talk to people, is to ask people, what do you need? What do you want to do? Like, let's find a way that like everyone can access the work that we're doing. Yeah, really important, um, Lauren. And I think one of the principles of organizing is always that we go to people. We don't expect them to come to us, right? So we'll go to where people are, whether it's a community center, their workplace, their homes, um, and we'll have proper one-to-one -one conversations and understand what people care about, what's impacting them, um, how they could get involved if they could, um, talk about how you know coming together can make a difference. But we never expect people to come to our meetings. We always go to theirs. So that's an important principle. I think Paul is going to jump in there. I see an unmuting. <laughs> Are you oh, going to jump in? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I didn't realise I was unmuted. I'm sorry, you probably can hear me typing. Um, I'll sort that next time. Um, uh, uh, somewhat agitational. I, I guess always we, we must always ask, um, you know, why are we trying to engage certain groups um, as, as, a, as a first? Uh, and who are the people engaging those groups? Um, and, you know, one of the iron rules for us in organising really is that you don't do for others that which that which they can do for themselves. Um, and so where's the fine line between um, helping to engage groups and for those groups organizing themselves? And, and Migrants Organized is a great example really, because um, uh, uh, you know, Migrants Organized was members of Citizens UK and the work was really about how do you develop those leaders so that they can take action um, for themselves rather than doing for them. Um, I, I guess also, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, it is, it is also about how do you meet people where they are? Um, and so I think that's kind of similar to Lauren's point about um, how does the listening meet them where in their experience of social action and engagement, um, which might be much lower. Um, and they might have lots of frustration and apathy about power and changing things. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you create an opportunity where you're engaging them where they are? Um, uh, and uh, in, in that breath, really, I talk about a guy called Valdemar from um, Christ Saviour Ealing, um, who was a cleaner uh, in, in, in um, Whitehall. And um, uh, it, 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 it came, they came across Valdemar through doing listening in their organisation. So it wasn't that they were trying to find Valdemar, they were just doing listening. Um, and it was in finding Valdemar uh, and inspiring the stories of hope that Valdemar thought that actually he needed to find um, more cleaners that were uh, uh, is interested in issues he was interested in. And so how are you finding people that are um, or, or building and developing people that can engage those groups that you're trying to engage rather than you engaging those groups? How are you finding the opportunities where you can develop people um, that it's in their interest to find other people like them and build with them? Um, and so to an extent, it's not like, oh, we need to do this, but instead we need to listen more. We need to spot more talent and then build around them and, 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 and uh, uh, work with their self-interest to, to find those groups. Great, thanks, Paul. And I think you're starting to bring in, hopefully everyone's starting to understand some of these key concepts and, and um, principles of organizing around identifying leaders, um, you know, building people to take action in their own communities, um, doing listening campaigns. You're starting to hear all these words that we use in our, in our work every day um, and getting a little bit of a picture of what organizing is about. Um, we have like two more minutes for questions. Um, so they're gonna have to be quick. Um, we've got a few follow on questions around listening. I think that's something that people are really interested in in, in, the, in the room um, around uh, describing listening communication techniques and how do you, turn kind of listening into an actionable plan. So maybe that's something that Ramina could talk about. Um, and then also we've got a question from Richard, which is what does the panel think about action like that of Extinction Rebellion? So kind of comparing community organizing to maybe some other types of organizing. Um, I don't know if any of the speakers specifically want to jump in on either of those questions in our last, our last two minutes of questions. Um, I'll just jump in quickly just to say also on the other question of, you know, people who are marginalised and um, have all these day to day um, challenges is that quite often they'll be the most resilient. So I think, you know, we, we can't assume that, um, you know, they're not going to be able to organise. I mean, 
in in the barracks there were people who were living in those awful conditions actually started a, a union um themselves and a committee and organizing and um so yeah uh, sometimes actually our role is to say like like my uh, colleagues have said what do you actually need and sometimes it's just like resources and material things like phones and like ways of um being able to organize so yeah i just wanted to say that. thanks Irina. Um, any last words on anything in the chat from Paul or Lauren? Feel free to jump in now. Yeah, um, can I just speak Go to that it. question about um, having the reaction of people who think that like you're selling them something and like obviously like Acorn as a dues paying organisation, like that is a challenge when you're asking people to like become a member and there is like a financial commitment. And I think like how we get around that is that, like, you'd never just come in and be like, oh, join the organization, end of. Um, and it's about starting to have those conversations with people at the beginning where you get them to like build that vision and get them thinking about what it would look like to take direct action, like engage them, like Paul was saying about like coming to people where they are, talking to them about their self-interest, about the issues that matter to them. Like, what do they want to see change? Who has the power to change that? And like, you know, have you tried to do anything about it? And if you have, did it work when you were by yourself? What if you had 50 people doing that? What would that look like? And getting people to think about like in practical, tangible terms, what it would look like to engage with what they're doing and why it's so important to have this many people behind you. And really reiterating that it's like, it's not a service that you're buying. It's like a community that you're a part of. It's an organization that you can play an active role in. And that as a result of it, like you can make these real tangible material changes in your life. It's not just about sitting around and talking about a better world. It's about making one. Um, and I think people really engage with that if you take the time to like have those conversations. Um, yeah. Amazing, great. I think that's a really nice um, note to move into the next section, unless anyone has any final things to say. I'll give you the last opportunity to jump in. No, okay, great. Well, maybe the speakers can carry on engaging in the chat for a bit if anyone else has any other questions. Um, but thank you all three of you for coming and joining us um, and for giving us your, your time and your experiences because hopefully people have found them really, really helpful. Um, and I know I, I always like hearing, uh, yeah, uh, other organizers amazing work um and i think yeah it's a good good transition point because lots of what the speakers have spoken about um has been mentions of some of these key things around listening around power um so i think we're going to start off by talking about power a little bit because you'll have heard every speaker talk about building power um you know organizing to, to get power <laughs> taking on power and power is a really important word um, in, in organizing. And it's something that we kind of try and get to grips with at the very beginning of doing kind of any sort of organizing training or work, because um, if we don't have an understanding of what we're trying to build, then we're not going to be able to do it. Um, so power is really, really important. And um, so I'm just going to, if you, if you want to turn your cameras on, that would be amazing so we can see you and have some participation. But for those of you who either want to use the virtual thumbs up um, or wave at me, how do people feel in general about the idea of building power? Do you feel positive about it? Somewhere in the middle, thumbs down, can I get some indication? Okay, we've got, we've pr got pretty much positivity. Some in the middle, great, cool, nice. That's a good place to start. Um, lots of thumbs up, well then we're ready to go. Um, so yeah, building power is our is our um, is what we're trying to do in community organising. Um, so it's important to know what that is. Um, so does anyone want to have a go at defining what they think power means or is? Um, have a go. Either you can put it in the chat, or if anyone wants to unmute and tell me what they think power is, um, then we can start to kind of get to grips with it. No pressure. Put it in the chat. You can shout out. What is power? No point building it if we don't know what it is. Great. So we've got, um, Claire says, ability to make things happen, change. Power is the ability to know what, what one wants and to accomplish one's goal. Ability to create change, great. A, yeah, I think power is the ability to have agency over things that affect your life, amazing, yeah. Great. Okay, well, you've all kind of got it, which is great. Um, if you all had the wrong idea of what power was, then we'd have, we'd have some problems and have to start again. Um, 
But we kind of in organizing normally say that power is simply the ability to act. So it's quite a neutral thing. Um, it's something that can be used for good, can be used for bad, can be used by lots of people or few people. And in organizing, we kind of define that power as the ability to act into two different types of power. So we talk about um, dominant power and relational power. And this is something that if you're if you do any community organizing or any of you who have done some will will have lots of experience with. So as we've got in the chat, Nick has just said power over um, people, which is a, a very good summary of what we um, call dominant power. So dominant power is power over people um, and it tends to be bad in lots of people's experiences, um, but it's not always bad. It can be used for good. Um, if you imagine a, a parent stopping a child from running into the road, that's obviously dominant power, but it's being used for a good cause. Um, and then we have relational power. Um, and relational power is power through people, power through bringing people together um, through collaboration, through connection. Um, and that, again, tends to be good. So you've heard lots of examples about um, relational power being good. So, um, you know, bringing together people uh, to organize against um, landlords, tenants unions, bringing people together to organize in their workplaces, bringing people together to organize in their communities. So in community organizing, we talk about um, bringing people together to organize relational power. Um, so that's just a quick kind of starting point because I know that lots of um, conversations about power have already ha been happening in the session. Um, and I just wanna give you a little bit more of a kind of contextual understanding of what community organizing is in relationship to other types of organizing. So I'm gonna briefly share my screen um, and just show you a little graph that will give you an idea of how community organizing compares to other types of organizing that lots of you will have experience of. Um, can everyone see that? Someone give me a wave. Great, cool. So, uh, second slide, great. So. This is a kind of a graph that illustrates what we mean when we talk about community organizing as about building power and taking on power in comparison to some of the other types of, of um, social justice work that people do. So as I've said, community organizing is about building power, but it's also about changing power structures, right? So we build power in order to be able to take on other power structures and shift them. So organizing is about seeing who has power understanding it, understanding where it comes from, where, what are its sources, and seeing how we can shift that power and make structural changes. Um, and if you compare that to other types of social justice work, um, you will see that lots of those are about um, using or putting pressure on existing power structures um, to get wins. So kind of like um, lobbying power structures, maybe putting public pressure, media pressure on to get wins, whereas community organizing is about taking on that power and shifting it so that people have more power um, than the power they're organizing against and are therefore able to change things. So hopefully that gives you a kind of a little bit of an understanding of why it's slightly different um, in terms of the practice and also the aims of organizing compared to some of the other types of social justice work we do. And this is a very um, detailed uh, chart that I'm not gonna read all of, but um, we'll send these slides out afterwards, which is from Jane McLevy's um, book about organizing, which kind of gives you a little bit of a comparison between organizing and some other types of, um, of social justice work. Um, so I will let you look at that in your own time, but it talks about some of the things our speakers have spoken about in terms of identifying organic leaders, um, recruiting people from the community, uh, building power and having wins as part of that process, but not necessarily as the overall aim. Um, so we're going to move on to talk about listening campaigns because I know that's something that it seems lots of people in the chat are interested in and I'm getting the feeling, you know, from the chat and please do tell me if I'm wrong, that some of your transition groups might be interested in doing some kind of listening um, campaign or already are doing it and want to think about how you can do it um, better or how you can engage more people in that process. Um, so just to roll back, I know you've heard about it already, but what is a listening campaign? Um, a listening campaign is basically an exercise where we as a group or as an organiser go and listen to our communities, listen to the people we're working with, be it in a workplace, um, you know, in a housing block, um, in a wider community or a locality, and we listen to what people 
uh, care about, we listen to the issues that they're facing, we listen to their experiences, um, we kind of find out the specifics of what people are facing, so we, we often know about the overarching problems people have, but we find out those specifics, so you know, what is it that actually is, is you know, keeping you up at night, what, it, what is the thing that's actually concerning you, um, which bit of it do you think that we can, we can make a change on, um, what is it that you, you would put time and effort into coming together around in order to make a change so we we do a process of listening and we'll talk a little bit about how that happens but as it says on the screen why do we do it we do it for lots of different reasons um, we do it to build relationships so we've talked about how organizing is about building relationships in communities bringing people to, together in order to build collective power and listening campaigns are an amazing way to do that to connect with people to talk to people about the issues they're facing to get them on board with organizing we do it to build, build leaders. This is also something we've heard lots about from the speakers. So finding organic leaders in our communities, people who are already organizing, who are already doing work to advocate for their, their communities, who already have lots of relationships, finding out what they care about and whether we can support them or organize with them in order to make changes. Um, as I've said, identifying people's issues, finding out more about what's going on, um, what we what people care about, how we might have commonality and things we all care about, finding stories, finding out some of the amazing stories that we've already heard from our speakers um, and hearing about our community and start to discern exactly what action we could take. So Maimuna talked about how they turned those listening meetings into a charter. This is a similar process of, you know, listening all this information and then picking what is the actual thing that we want to do. Um, so, as I've said, it comes in two forms. It can be in a geographic area. So I know lots of you are organizing in groups um, in a locality. So it might be that you want to listen to a cross section of the community in that locality, or it can be listening to a specific group that you've identified. So listening to people affected by um, uh, housing issues or people um, in a certain workplace, et cetera. So we've, we've had good examples from speakers about those different types of listening. Um, and in the context of uh, the pandemic, um, we've been doing um, listening campaigns using these three methods. So phoning people up and having conversations on the phone, um, having Zoom house meetings or house parties or community meetings, lots of different words. So inviting people to come together on Zoom as they would in person and have these kind of conversations and having one-to-one -one conversations. And we're not going to have time today to talk about one-to-ones, -one, but one to ones or relational meetings are a really foundational part of community organizing. And that's about having a kind of respected, intentional conversation where you start to understand what someone cares about, what drives them, and find commonality. So we have one to one conversations with leaders in communities and listen to them and their, their perspectives. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity to actually start to think about how you could run a listening campaign in your local area. And so I want to put you into breakout rooms to do a little bit of community mapping. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what community mapping is. Um, community mapping is a tool that we use as organisers all the time, and I'm sure lots of you have done some mapping of your local areas for the projects you're currently working on. But this is basically where we get as much information down um, on paper or on a spreadsheet or however you want to do it about our local community so that we can start to understand um, who is you know, operating there, who is doing campaigns, what communities are already kind of acting on, um, where there are gaps, where there are skills, um, and kind of understanding who we need to listen to and where we can fit in and where we need to build relationships. So a kind of starter community organizing community map would look at the market actors, state actors, and civil society. Um, so just very quickly, uh, your market actors would be your key industries, your big employers, um, any kind of big um, business development or um, your high streets, your football clubs, uh, local media. So thinking about kind of those key actors in your locality and um, the state. So thinking about your local council, who are your councillors, um, who are the councillors you have relationships with, which parties do they represent, your MPs, um, the local police. Uh, and the local NHS and thinking about, you know, how are these different groups accountable? Are there boards, are there trusts that you can have relationships with? And then civil society. So thinking through 
all the things that make, make up our local communities from schools, universities, trade unions, housing associations, um, religious institutions, charities, everything. Um, and a map can be so much more complex than these three things, but this is a really good place to start. So often once we've done these, we'll add on things like online spaces in which people in a locality um, congregate. So kind of like, you know, your, um, I think of an example, Hackney's LGBT community Facebook group, for example, or um, a local park where lots of people congregate every Saturday, uh, or a local shop where lots of people um, it's been there for ages where lots of people know the owner and they go there every you know Saturday morning to pick up their newspaper and have a chat and we start to get more of a kind of uh, textured kind of understanding of our community and, and layer it up with the kind of physical spaces the online spaces the key events that happen so we really know um, who we're organizing with and who we have relationships with um, so I'm going to stop sharing his little example of a map very basic um, we're going to stop sharing and what we're going to do is put you into breakout rooms and I know that you're all from very different places um, so you won't be mapping the same area but we want you to just uh, go into a breakout room for like 10 minutes um, and start to kind of discuss the key things in your community that you have relationships with so you know do you have relationships with certain community groups or churches and some of those that I've talked about that you don't have relationships that you'd like to start um, building relationships with and just start doing a kind of generalized map of these kind of things and having a conversation. So does anyone want to uh, just give us a little feedback from your room in terms of what you spoke about, anything, any kind of interesting conversations or anything that you realize that you as, a, uh, as an organizer needed to do in terms of building relationships or where you already have relationships, feel free to just jump in, unmute yourself or comment in the chat. Um, I might ask, uh, I might kick off nice and easy unless anyone jumps out with Lauren because she was in a breakout room to, to feedback on what your your group were talking about. Yeah, happy to. We had sort of like a kind of broader, I think, conversation about organising in communities and about um, the work that Joe um, and Alfred were doing um, in Hull and in Ireland. Um, around food and food poverty and growing, um, also around giving voice to like homeless communities. Um, and yeah, just sort of a conversation about like taking these sort of broad strokes problems, um, things like food poverty and homelessness and breaking them down into like tangible material issues, things that can be measured, things that can be tackled, um, about self-interest, um, finding out what it is that people wanna see change and using that to like move them to action. Um, also about looking at people and like who are your constituents, who are your allies, who are your opponents, who's going to be on your side, who's not going to be on your side, and about everyone sort of having an agenda um, and finding out what that is, how you can use that to your advantage. Um, but yeah, I joined the room late, so um, Alistair and Joe might have been having a discussion before I arrived um, about some other stuff as well that they might want to feed back on. Great, that sounds amazing. Um, and again, um, for those of you who are new to community organising, you're going to be hearing, um, as Lauren just said, quite a lot of these kind of principles and skills that we use, things like, um, you know, identifying winnable campaigns. So we have a system of identifying what's winnable by looking at how uh, it impacts people, how deeply felt it is, how widely felt it is in the community, um, if we know the target and can win. And also it sounds like you're talking a bit about kind of spectrum of allies. So kind of who is already on our side, who do we need to move? Um, so for anyone who's kind of hearing these things and getting excited by them, um, you can hear more <laughs> uh, if you come and do some community organizing with one of um, the speakers or, or a group, um, and we'll put that in the chat because normally we spend, you know, weeks training people on all these different things. Um, so if it's exciting you, then please do get in touch in the chat. Did anyone from another group have any interesting conversations um about uh your organizing you're doing or any mapping i might pick on someone who's smiling mm, everyone's now everyone's now purposely not smiling which is just mean <laughs> um judith you're smiling can i pick on you is that okay i'm gonna unmute you sorry um you were uh <laughs> yes I was laughing at your joke, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was quite inspired uh, by um, the two um, gentlemen that I was uh, talking to because I'm I'm new to this. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in 
um, in how to get the community going, but I, I feel like I'm in first grade and I know nothing. So um, this is all great because um, it's, it's adding to my to-do list or what can I do list. Um, and um, so, yes, yeah, so, so there were two inspiring um, people who, who talked about their, their projects. And I have something in mind um, that I would like to get in, in gear, but I don't know how to, act, to, to connect to people that live around me. <laughs> so as, um, as I said, I feel in, like in grade one, but um, I, I'm starting to get ideas on how to, to act on this and to get going. Yes. Great. Great. That sounds like a really useful conversation. And I'm sure the organisers will um, can link with you in the chat to see if they can link you up with people where you are. Um, but also, you know, mapping is a good tool to start if you have an idea to start thinking about who in the community um, you're in, who also might care about it and maybe starting to reach out or who might be doing something around it already and starting to reach out. So um, hopefully you can, yeah, take on some of the things we've talked about and, and build on them. I think we also had a hand up. Um, but it's disappeared. Was it Belle? Or was that my imagination? Yes, hi, sorry. Go for it. Go for it. Fantastic. I was just saying, um, it's really interesting having our chats. One of the things I'm aware of is that in the past, uh, people who are in the lower income side of things, you weren't so, you know, they weren't so visible, if you see what I mean. But with COVID uh, and also the community pulling together, in a sense, if, if people who haven't had so much money, et cetera, have become more vid visible in a way, because all the community is trying to help out with donating food, donating money, and they're doing different raffles, and people I haven't met before, um, I've got to know, and that's been really nice um, to see the community working together. So in the past, everyone's been doing their own stuff, but it's nice that the community do want to try and help out each other. And the other one was that, um, you mentioned about the John Muir, Trust, which is in the in Scotland, and you know uh, the person there was talking about it, and I was thinking that I've even heard about them. They're, they talked a lot about a lot in Forest School, so I'm going to have a look at see how they do things just to encourage the uh, communities and the things they're doing. Um, and it's just interesting to hear about what everyone else is doing. Thanks. Great, great. That sounds really good. And um, yeah, I think you brought up a really important point about kind of part of mapping is identifying the existing. Um, support networks that exist in our communities and, and the mutual aid groups have been a really good example of that in lots of areas and seeing how we can engage with the people who have been involved in that to kind of work out what um, we can take from those mutual aid groups and build mm. into into kind of building collective power to do other things after the pandemic is over mm. so I think that's a really important point mm. um, I'm going to call on uh, Paul because I think Paul has something um, and then I've just seen Pam wave as well so I'll come to you after this Pam but I think Paul um, have something to say as well. Uh, no, I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to show something because, um, you know, just, just to show how, how, how um, important this kind of like tool is, and I think it, it, it goes back to what Judith was saying in regards to where to start, you know, um, and, and just to say that I, I described this as a, a campaign. By no means, you know, if you start this exercise are you expected to know it all in fact it should be an agitation on you when you don't know it all to, to that's the first campaign the first campaign is to get a better idea of the picture of your community and the power that exists in it and who do you need to talk to that's going to allow you to have that that picture so i'm just going to quickly share my screen if i would be allowed um this was this was this was an internal uh, analysis of of uh, the frontline community for any of you that know um it's a uh, uh, um, the the teach first of social workers, um, and they are doing community organising across across the country, and, and doing an exercise with them to understand the people that are in in their in their community, um, and starting to think about who are the people that are you know powerful that have got position, who are the people that have got some money, who are the people that have got some relationships from what they know, and building that up over time um, from having a kind of relational conversations but then kind of thinking about kind of the next stage I would say Beth which is we all have an agenda right and so how does that community mapping fall into the agenda or the self-interest that you might have what do you care about if it's about the climate change if it's about environments about housing um 
what is the question you're potentially going for and how are those people that you've identified and businesses and organizations are they allies yet and what level of power do they have in 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 in, in helping you win on this particular self-interest which might then start help you helping you judith in particular thinking about where do you want to start exercising your energy because we've all got only a certain amount of time which i was saying in, in my group you know not everybody's got uh, uh, unlimited time and so we need to think about those that are most powerful um, and most likely to be allies with us um, and, and where we're going to focus our energy um, if you if you would think Judith and others that are thinking about this who are the 10 people that you can meet over the next month or two months you're gonna you're gonna want to intentionally think about who are those that are most likely to be powerful most likely to have other relationships and most likely to be able to help you have influence um, so I just wanted to show that if that's if that's helpful by any means by any means I, I think I had yeah that's it great thank you um very see we're just so in sync community organizers because what you're going to do next is a power map oh sorry <laughs> so you're gonna no don't worry <laughs> it's a perfect example of what you're going to do next so hopefully you'll 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 do exactly what Paul just showed in terms of turning these community maps into understanding um the relationships but before we go on to that um, I think Bell and Pam also had their hands up and there's more hands going up. Um, so Pam, go for it. And then we'll go to Richard and then Bell again. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the mapping of things for the benefit of other people in the community to use is crucial, isn't it? And it's not always easy to get that right. So on our transition site, we do have an actual Google map and there's a pin for the groups and that is it, plus an explanation of what that group does. But there's so much more that could be done and in our breakout room paul and i just talked about two mapping tools the sum app and the green map app that you can create these asset maps on and yes it would be great to create those but it, they also have to be accessible to people so that people can see who you're talking about what groups are doing what various things like that so i'd just be interested to see what things people have used that are in, I don't know, the public domain, what do they look like and where are they cited? Um, and how do people make use of them? And also can people contribute to them? So if I'm a mm. member of a, another group that's not on there, can they add to it? Or is it, a, is it a matter of sending somebody an email saying, can you add me please? You know, that kind of thing. Thank you. That's great it. question. Yeah, yeah, great, great conclusion. Can I just um, respond directly there because we are actually holding uh, mapping process throughout this whole summit that started on the um, opening night and will be going out over the whole three weeks and Roxy who's in this session she'll put something in the chat now she's holding that process and she's really like there's other people that are involved already and anyone else who wants to get involved and um, there's a group on the nudge uh, on the losing control platform we'll put that in the chat and you can get in touch with her if you're interested in mapping and we're doing at this stage more of a because it, you know it's national understanding who the people and projects and organizations are in in our movement and where the gaps are but and we haven't brought that power stuff in yet but potentially that's something people from this group could could help us do to start to explore and use those tools collaboratively and Roxy knows a lot about this and has got some great online tools um so yeah do she'll put the links in the chat and do get in touch with her if you're interested in doing that as part of the summit Great, um, thank you. And I think you've uh, both what Pam and Paul said kind of brings up some other questions about kind of the use of mapping. So we obviously talked about how it can be a start of doing a listening campaign, identifying who you need to listen to, but it's also, you know, so much, so many more uses than that. Um, and as an organizer, when you go into a new place um, that you haven't organized in before, for example, um, it can take you six months to build this, this map or it can take, you know, you start and it's an endless project, as Paul said, and, you know, you really start to build up and that's something you can start to think about in terms of not just these institutions, but who are the people within it that we need to start building relationships with. So we talk about things like gatekeepers, who are the people that can give you access to those um, organisations. Um, and a story I always tell regarding gatekeepers um, is that I was once doing a project um, in Hackney, which is where I'm from, and we were trying to um, get this church on side in the campaign. And I kept meeting um, with the priest and I was going back and back and like 
being like, you know, could we, you know, your congregation are really affected by this, you know, had one to one, had tea, you went to a nice cafe, like, please could I come and speak to your congregation about this? Could we, you know, have a meeting? Um, can I come after? Can I come before the service? Um, and he kept being like, oh, maybe, you know, no, you know, and not kind of getting back to me being a bit resistant. Um, and one day after like our third meeting, I was getting a bit frustrated and kind of was leaving the church. And um, the woman who organizes the kind of coffee mornings after the service kind of grabbed me and was like, why are you talking to him? He doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, he, he talks at the front, but I organize everything else. He doesn't come and smoke to me. Um, of course, you can come for coffee after. That's why everyone starts chatting anyway, and you can come and talk to everyone. And she knew all the families that, you know, had come to the church for years and she knew everyone. And I was like, oh, classic rookie mistake. You know, you've got to find the people who you can really build relationships with and who can open up these um, communities so that you can start to listen and engage with them. So that's just a little nugget of a classic community organising mistake. Um, so, yeah, thinking about who are the people that you want to start building relationships with on this map, not just the names of these groups. And starting to think about what's missing. So... For example, um, when I first started working, I uh, worked in Putney for a long time, if anyone's from Putney. Um, and when I first started working there, um, I kind of was looking, I knew that there was a large Muslim community and I was looking for a mosque um, and kind of like Googling it and, you know, looking on maps and being like, where is the mosque? Um, and, you know, so I wanted to find the institution um, and kind of realized that there wasn't one and the nearest mosque was in Tooting. Um, and um, I was kind of looking on Facebook and things and I found that there was a group um, who were kind of organizing a to rent out community halls and you know community centers every Friday to hold prayers because there wasn't a mosque and I was like oh great okay so through this Facebook group I can go and chat to this community and we ended up running a campaign to get the council to um, give the community a space to have a mosque so, you know, it's not only what does exist and what institutions are there, but what doesn't exist and what informal kind of communities are there that we can start engaging with. So, you know, you get all sorts of interesting things from mapping and so hopefully uh, by doing it and thinking about it in terms of your context, you'll start to kind of pull out these really um, interesting and helpful things that you can build on in terms of the kind of campaigns you want to run. Um, Richard, I think you had your hand up, did you? Yeah, go yeah, for it. Just really briefly, and forgive me if I just missed this, but Paul, when you were sharing your screen, that was because a lot of people were talking about, hey, we need to connect online and we can't do it face to face. And people, you know, early in the chat, people were yearning for that face to face connection. But I just thought the tool you used there was Jamboard, right? Which is a really accessible tool on any Gmail account. I just wanted to highlight that if people are organizing online, but over to you if you want to uh, say a bit more about the, that tool. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. It totally is. I, I'm uh, it, it Jamboard. The thing about Jamboard is not only is it something good online in a space like this, but it's ongoing. So once people have access to it, it's ongoing. So like I'm saying to you, and I think this is really important to know that the building of this kind of power analysis or community mapping is a campaign in itself. You know, your action team or your team should be thinking about this power analysis. And every time you come back to meet, you know, you should see new people or new organizations that have been added to it. And people have saying, yes, I actually met with the imam or I've met with the head teacher and X and they're really powerful. This is their interest. And boom, they're on the, they're on the, they're on the map now. Um, and um, we can start thinking about how we work with them. Um, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's lots of, Jamble is a really good example because it's so accessible. There's other things like, um, I use, if you're doing a more complicated one in your group, I use something called Airtable, um, which I'll put a link to in the chat, which is kind of like a more accessible version of Excel, which multiple people can work on at once. So um, yeah, there's lots of different tools you can use in your group that will allow people to kind of do this mapping in a really uh, kind of efficient and productive and interesting way where you can map relationships. Um, so we are running tight on time. And I did say at the beginning that this is very much like a kind of like, example of what you might uh, experience if you came to a longer community organizing session um so please forgive me if i haven't got around to your question but paul very helpfully showed um an example of what kind of next steps we can do with a um, community map when we're starting to actually think about doing a campaign and thinking about um 
engaging the community with this idea of building power. Um, so the kind of other mapping tool that we use is a power map. And again, lots of you might have experienced this before, but just very quickly to run through, um, Paul's one was actually much nicer than mine. Mine's just one I put on a PowerPoint really quickly. I apologize for that. Um, hopefully you can see it. So a power map is um, a map with an axis where we can start to map how much power people have in relationship to the, to the work we're doing. So I have um, agree with us on one side, disagree with us on the other side. And then we have power at the top. So they have powerful at the top and not powerful at the bottom. And you can see a scale. So we've got kind of like decision makers at the top in the room when decisions are made, given major consideration, noticed but not considered and not noticed. So an understanding of how much power they have in relationship to an issue. And this is a really important um, thing that we will use uh, when we start to think about those relationships that we've built and put plotting them onto this to understand how they might engage with the campaign. So who are the people that are powerful that we need to move in order to win a campaign? Do we need to bring them to our side? Do we need to reduce their power? And who are the people that we need to bring together to build collective power? So for example, um, in a classic campaign, you might have, I'm gonna take one that I've done many times because I mostly organize in housing. Um, so you might have, a landlord up here. Um, you may have some councillors over here. And let's say we have a situation where we have really bad housing conditions um, and the landlord is refusing to fix them. And then we might have people over here who um, care about this issue. So residents, um, community groups, maybe we might have schools and, and GPs because their kids are coming uh, because of uh, the impact of mold on their health. So we might have um, schools and GPs. And we start to build um, an idea of who are the people on our community map that might care about this, so community groups. And then this helps us understand who it is that we need to build our strategy around. So I'm doing a very quick example here but thinking about things like how do we build collective power amongst these people so that we can um, move them up the map and get build them more power? And what tactics and strategies can we adopt to either reduce the landlord's power or move them and put pressure on them to come towards our side? And um, thinking about other actors, so how can we uh, get the councillors to put pressure on the landlord to move to our side, for example. So you start to be able to map out how you might strategically think about bringing all these people you've mapped together and engaging them in a campaign. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It's a very quick example. And we haven't got long left. And I wanted to put you into a breakout room to kind of have a chat about um, how you actually do a map. Um, and I'm gonna do it for five minutes anyway even though we don't have time because I really want you to be able to do it and then we're gonna wrap up really quickly um so what I want you to do in a breakout room is have a go at kind of thinking through who would you put on this map if you were doing a campaign for this scenario so I'm going to give you a scenario everyone listen up so imagine you are a campaigner um in a local area and the council have just declared that they are going to close all the libraries in the entire borough within six months. So they're gonna close all the libraries in six months. And you have just heard this news. Um, and who are you going to put on this power map to start engaging in making sure that doesn't happen? Um, so I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms for literally like five minutes. I just want you to have a really quick chat about who would be the people that you would wanna engage in this. Who are the people who have power to make the decision? Who are the people who have influence? And who are the people who you think would really care um, would have self-interest in this issue, would want to engage in it, and then we'll come back together. Um, sorry, that was so quick. Again, trying to squeeze so much into to our session to give you a flavour of what this is all about. Um, but hopefully you had a really good conversation and feel free to put in the chat um, anything interesting that came out of it. Um, when I do this session, normally we have some wild ideas because we normally um, do this power map and then move into kind of putting it onto an escalation of tactics. Um, and people always, normally the first thing people suggest is that they get all the kids from all the local schools to do sit read-ins, so sit-ins but read-ins in the libraries for the whole six months. 
and ambitious ambitious is all I'm saying but a very good tactic um if you can get all the kids to sit sit in the library for six months then I'm sure you'd win that campaign um so yeah hopefully you had some good conversations about who uh, in your communities um hypothetically might care about this issue and engage in it and can see how that could be a helpful tool in terms of the work that you're doing locally um i am going to quickly wrap up and then pass back to rihanna to talk about the rest of um the summit um thank you all so much for coming and giving us your attention it's been a long session um so thank you for staying throughout it and um hopefully you've had a flavor of what we mean by community organizing what it means um to build power um, what we, why we prioritise it, so why we think it's, it's an important strategy, building power in communities so that people can not just win one campaign, but make long-term structural changes, um, and started to kind of understand some of those key principles and skills that we use in organising um, to start us off, those things around mapping, community mapping, power mapping, um, and if any of you are interested in kind of thinking through um, how you build on this and do community organizing um, as part of your your practice um, then I think a, a link will be put in the chat to um, just a small plug training program <laughs> um, that uh, I'm running which is an eight-week training program which is an introduction to community organizing but also to Citizens UK if you want to get involved in any of the work that citizens do um, and hear more about community organizing through that um, and in those sessions we talk about things like how we build relationships with people so once we've mapped them and understood who we need to engage with how we actually build relationships that are based upon trust um, and commonality um, how we start to um, build these collectives and then how we start to win campaigns so looking at tactics and strategies identifying leaders um, getting through apathy um, all sorts of different things so hopefully you enjoyed the session um, and I will stick around in the chat to answer any questions. And I think Paul and Lauren are still here, um, so I can also do that. Again, yes, join Acorn. Everyone should join Acorn, even if you don't, you know, even if you, even if, even if you don't live in an area with Acorn in it, even if you don't need to, join Acorn because it's great. And and hopefully you can maybe get involved in a local branch or help set one up. Even is that a thing? Yeah, Lauren's nodding. That's a thing. Um, so yeah, we'll put those in the chat, and I will pass to Rhiannon to um, give you more information about the rest of of the summit. Mm -hmm.